6 now. I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible, to turn there with me. Last time we finished up chapter 5, where we talked about true righteousness. What does true righteousness look before the Lord? Not an outward thing, but an inward reality. And so now in chapter 6, we're going to be going into what is true devotion. In the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is going to address three areas of devotion that should be expected from the believer. And that is giving, prayer, and fasting. Now if you know that as you do your Bible study, you look for words that are repeated over and over again that God is wanting to draw attention to. That's one of the basic principles of Bible study. And so in this beginning of these uh, verses of chapter 6, you're going to see four words repeated by Jesus Christ. And He's doing this intentionally. And that is the word when. Jesus does not say if you pray or if you fast, but when. This is to be expected from the disciple of the Lord. Second of all, you're going to see the word hypocrite uh, repeated a couple of times because Jesus is drawing a contrast of that which he does not like. What the Father does not like and what will will not be honored. And that is those who are doing it for an ulterior motive. Third, you're going to see that Jesus is going to repeat the word secret. That, That is what does please the Father. What does get his attention. And then finally, repeatedly through this part of devotion, Jesus is going to use the word reward. Because Father is a good Father who delights to give reward. Amen? It was His idea. So let's look with this together, beginning in verse 1. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will Himself reward you openly. This word here, charitable deed, probably other translations you have, is the word alms. This was the same word that Jesus used in Luke chapter 12, verse 33, when Jesus says, sell what you have and give alms. Same Greek word. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, Jesus says. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. So this word alms, or charitable deeds, this is primarily used as an act of compassion to show upon the poor. This is what was used in Acts chapter 3, when you have the man that's lame, and he's asking for alms. And then Peter and John declare the healing of Jesus Christ upon him, and he rises up leaping and jumping for joy. And this is the same word that's used in Acts 10 with Cornelius. It says in verse 3, that the ninth hour of the day that Cornelius saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius! And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Come on, isn't that powerful? When you give to the Lord, when you give alms to the Lord, it's a memorial before His throne. Friend, I want you to be encouraged tonight that God is watching what you're giving. And this is an opportunity for you and I to worship And to thank Him for His benevolence and His generosity to us. And to show the reality of our gratitude to Him. Now obviously Jesus is addressing here the motive. That we are to do it as unto Him in secret. Not to be seen by men. But the understanding that the Father is watching us at all times. And He's looking at what our heart condition is in in regard to our money and to our wealth and our possessions. 
I came across these quotes I thought were powerful. Ignatius of Antioch, the early church father, said, Teach us to give and not to count the cost. That's the kind of heart God wants. Adrian Rogers, the man of God from Bellevue Baptist who passed on to be with Jesus, says, It's what you sow that multiplies, not what you keep in the barn. That's the word of God in Proverbs chapter 11. The one who sows generously is going to reap generously. This is our opportunity to do that. And I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. How many can testify to this? Charles Spurgeon said, In all my years of service to my Lord, I have discovered a truth that has never failed and has never been compromised. That truth is beyond the realm of possibilities that one has the ability to outgive God. Even if I give the whole of my word to Him, He will find a way to give back to me much more than I gave. Is there any witnesses in the house that can testify of that? You can't outgive God. Does he not say in Malachi, test me, prove me in this way. And the amazing thing is, friend, is that it doesn't, he didn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do that because even the promise that it is a treasure in heaven is enough. Let alone that he wants to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory and have such an abundance that we can be ministers and instruments of his love to those around us. That they would see the reality of Jesus Christ. So I want to honor you for the way that you give on Saturday evening. Because it's directed towards those who need it. It's directed to opportunities to minister to people in Nicaragua. To people in Nigeria. I hope maybe next week I can show a video of how there is a church in Nigeria because of this fellowship. This this church, Steel Creek. This is why we give saints. Saints. We want it to be a memorial to God. And to say, Lord, advance your kingdom and let this be used to minister to those who need it. Amen. That's the opportunity we have as a church, friend. Because many times you can say, should I give to this? Is it going to go to the right place? Is it, is it really to those who need it? And those in the church as a covering should be able to discern through time and through witness and through prayer that yes, God is leading us to these people that we can pour the love of God. And it's used, not in, not in something of just of sympathy, but we were being led by God and will bring forth eternal free, fruit for His praise. I want to I um, go into the second one because this is the primary way I want to focus. Look at verse 5 with me. Jesus says, And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But when you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. So Jesus is saying two things here that God says that he does not like. One, those who pray to be seen, those who pray to be seen as spiritual, those who want to have people recognize their spirituality. And number two, those who use vain repetitions. It's fascinating to me as... God has graced me and allowed me to live in Africa for seven years and to travel to, to Southeast Asia and to minister in India. I've, I've come directly in contact with the three major religions of the world. It's very interesting how applicable these words are. I was thinking about it even as I was praying tonight. Almost every religion uses beads. And they just without even thinking, say and repeat these words over and over again. And they're just, they're just going through these beads in Islam and in Buddhism and in Hinduism. And also in another sect of what we call Christianity that you guys know what I'm talking about. Just going through it. No talking to the Father, no real interaction, just a thing that I go through in order to do some kind of a formula. And I, I, it's, it's, Jesus is very clear here. 
This does not please him. Now let me say this also. We can be guilty of that in the evangelical church as well. We can just go and we can pray and it can become this routine. It can be something that we just are doing as some kind of a rhetoric. And we have to guard our hearts. Am I speaking from my heart to the Father? Now sometimes we can, we can just be long-winded and we can just go on and on not, and not really think about what we're praying. We're talking to the Father. We're recognizing as someone saying, uh, one sister saying, I don't want to worship you as if you're not in the room. I don't want to pray as if you're not in the room. I'm talking to my Father. And when you have that revelation, friend, you, you don't just talk. There's a recognition that this is coming from my heart. Now, sometimes people do it in ignorance. And I've said this before. I, I was rebuked by someone in my younger years of praying. They said, wait, you just are using words to be fillers. You don't talk like that normally. Why are you using those words to be fillers? And I was convicted. It hurt. It didn't feel good. But I was convicted. That, is, that, is, that, is, my, is that truly from my heart? Or am I just doing this because it sounds right? Now, sometimes people do that in ignorance. And in the worst case scenario, when you have someone that will use formulas, listen to me, friend, it can even begin to almost move to a place of a form of witchcraft. That people think they can use a formula to manipulate God to get Him to do something because you're going to pray in a certain way. That's not how it works. It's a relationship. Be careful of catchphrases as if you can twist the hand of God to make something manifest. It's from the heart of a child. I've been, around, I've been around the camp a couple times in the body of Christ. I hear people talk about the power of God and all these things and, and how little fruit comes. And now look over here, someone who just from the heart in all humility just calls on the Lord and boom, the power of God manifests. Why? Because it's out of relationship not out of some kind of formula, some kind of magical right phrase. Now, if you didn't know, this church is all about what's called the target. And Calvin has said over and over again, verse 6 is the bullseye. Everything we do, saints, is connected in our lives to verse 6. And you can see that the disciples got this. When they're looking at Jesus, heal the sick, cast out devils, multiply food, preach to the masses, and be able to call them to all these miracles, they recognized where it came from. How do I know that? Because they did not ask Jesus, teach us to pray for the sick. They did not ask Jesus, teach us to cast out devils. They did not ask Jesus, how do we multiply bread? How do we become a preacher like you? They, there's one question the disciples ask in Luke chapter 11. Lord, teach us how to pray. Amen. They recognize that everything Jesus did was out of an overflow of this relationship and this intimate walk with the Father. So I want to encourage you here tonight, friend. This is where it is for you and I. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are you praying to the Father in secret? Are you drawing near to the Father in the secret place? Because Father is waiting to meet with you. He's waiting to you to come away with Him. Everything is changed by that time. And we have to, as saints, continue to persevere and to press on and to want more of that time with Father. And if you don't believe in spiritual warfare then you just say to yourself, I'm going to determine to spend more time with, father in this, I'm going to have more time with my father in a secret place. You'll begin to see the reality of spiritual warfare. Because the enemy wants nothing with you at all connecting to him, the father, in prayer. And he will send all kinds of distractions, all kinds of worries and thoughts, whatever he can do, and your flesh will, will so fight against this but friend, as someone said, pray until you pray. Pray until you move from that place of just saying, oh, even if it's a struggle, to a place where all of a sudden you're realizing, I'm in the presence of the King. I'm in the presence of Almighty God. Hallelujah. 
Let's, let's pray this together. I'll, 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 let's maybe say verse 8. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner therefore pray. Let's say this together, will we? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I want to break down some things about this prayer. Our Father. Now even in the, in the church, friend, there's even people debating and bickering. If you don't call God by Yahweh, then He won't really hear you. Or you should use the name Jehovah. Or you should use this name or that name. There isn't one recorded time that Jesus addresses Him other than Father. Please don't get hung up in all of this banter about the name of God. Yes, we honor the, the name Yahweh. We honor the name or how it's transliterated many times, Jehovah, although there's no J in the Hebrew language. But the point is, He wants us to call Him Abba, Father. That's Papa, Daddy. That's what He wants us to call Him. This place of intimacy, this place of truly knowing he is my father and I'm his son or his daughter. From that just removes a lot of this other nonsense and just brings us to the reality. Do you know him? Not about him. Do you know him? Our father who art in heaven. If there's any wondering of whether we should... We want, if it's going to be irreverent that we address God as Father, it should not be, that should be removed by the, that next line. Who art in heaven? When you pray, friend, I want you to be reminded tonight that there are true, two primary Old Testament scriptures that the disciples who would have heard this prayer when they heard heaven, that their mind would have gone towards. Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6. What is going on in heaven? When we are praying our Father who art in heaven, our minds should go there as well, as well as Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 7 and 20, 21 and 22. Yes. That we recognize that God is on His throne. Yes. And that there's myriads of angels who are crying out, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Right. You are holy. And it's so magnificent that Isaiah says that the, even the, 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 the post of the temple shook. Can you imagine? That's what's happening right now in, in heaven, friends. This is who we come before. And what does it do to us when we just take the moment to behold God on His throne? Friend, I'll tell you what it does. It will remind you. That you're coming before an all-knowing, an all-hearing, and everywhere present, and an all-powerful God. It will change the way you pray. You won't come with some half-hearted wondering. You will begin to remember, my God is God. And He is on His throne. Faith will rise in you. As you take a moment to re recognize and remember what's going on in heaven, according to Ezekiel 1 and, and Isaiah 6. Hallowed be your name. I believe that this is one thing that I think is so important because if, if you don't know already, the word name in the Hebrew is Hashem. And the word name to the Hebrew is when you say someone's name, you're declaring their character. There are seven primary names of God the Father in the Old Testament. I encourage you to learn those. Because it reveals His character. Yahweh Ira, Jehovah Jireh, He is our provider. How is He our provider? First and foremost, through the cross. We can go often and say, He's my provider for my deal. Yes, He is. He's your provider for your food. But friend, the context of Yahweh Yireh is Abraham about to offer his son Isaac and God providing a substitutionary atoning sacrifice for his son and that's what he's done through us for us through Jesus Christ. 
Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who is my healer. Yahweh Shalom, my peace. Yahweh Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh Mekadeshkin, the Lord is my sanctifier. Yahweh Shema, the Lord who is present. I want to encourage you. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. What do all these things point to of the names of God? They point to who the character of Father is. Why is this important? Because many of us in this room have had, or has to say all of us, have had an imperfect example with our earthly fathers. But some of us have had really damaging impact because of our of an earthly father and and he did and we can project that upon heavenly father and that's not his character and these names we study the word of God we come to the revelation this is God this is who I serve and I trust him and what is the first thing we should pray after we've praised God your kingdom come this is it this is both a uh, uh, A now and a not yet. Jesus says, if I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. But he also talks about the kingdom of come. When the disciples said, Lord, when will your kingdom come? What is the sign of your your coming? And he talks about this future coming. So it's both and. It's not either or. But I want to encourage you, when you pray your kingdom come, I want you to first remember that the kingdom is that everything in, in the kingdom is the jurisdiction that the king reigns over. And that Lord, that you're asking first, Father, your kingdom come. In other words, Lord, I want everything in my life to demonstrate that I am submitted to your authority in my life. Your kingdom come over my marriage. Come on. Your kingdom come over my children. Your kingdom come over this home that you've given me, God. Your kingdom come over the workplace that you have placed me in. Because, friend, God wants to bring his kingdom through you. And I, I, I want to encourage you tonight, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, it should not be the same because you're there. It should be changing because Jesus lives in you, if you know him. You are the epicenter of the manifestation of God's kingdom. So I want to encourage you, pray that, and make sure that everything in your life is submitted to God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus showed. He was preoccupied with the will of the Father. This is what he said in John 8, um, 638. He said, I did not come to do anything of myself. He said, I didn't come down from heaven to do, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This was what Jesus was constantly seeking and to abide in. And that was the will of the Father. Friend, I want to encourage you. Make this your daily prayer. Please. Every day you wake up, Father, not my will be done. I want your will to be done through my life. And I want to tell you, friend, He will answer that prayer. As I was sitting before God today, I was moved to tears again. As I've been saying, Lord, if your will be done, my mind raced to my past and over these years of my life and all of the ways that Father has faithfully guided and provided for me and my family. Undeniable, miraculous, I'm undone in His presence of how He faithfully fulfills His will if we submit to it. Friend, would you make this your prayer? And how is it that we will know His will most first and foremost in our lives? By studying the Word of God. As you know the Word of God, you know His will for your life. Give us this day our daily bread. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 that Israel was set forth as an example to us. And so we see a principle that God, this is connected, I believe, to Exodus 16, when the, when, when the people of Israel were in the wilderness and they're asking God, and God provided manna for them. He provided what they daily needed. He wanted them to, sh- to show them, I am the one who will provide for you. I am the one who will sustain you. And I know how to meet all your daily needs. And so it is for us, friend, that we also would be understanding that everything that we need, God will provide for. 
And we need to be reminded He truly is a source of what you have. We can lose sight of that, friends, with our refrigerators. We can lose sight of that with our freezers. I, I pray that you... I pray that everyone here, that you will have an encounter with God every time you go into the grocery store. That you will be undone at the provision of God. The variety that you have. That you will just worship God. Lord, thank you for giving me these finances that I can choose all of these different kinds of food. Because I'm going to tell you, friend, most of the world's population isn't like that. All they have is rice and fish. Rice and fish, if they're blessed. I've been in many places where they don't have anything but rice and some sauce. God is... Give Him glory. Amen. And I believe there's a second principle also. That that there's a principle of our daily bread being connected to the Word of God. Deuteronomy Deuteronomy chapter 8. You guys know this. So He humbled you, God says. Allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor your fathers know, that he might make known to man that he will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Friend, this is our daily bread also with the word of God. Thank you, Father, for providing my spiritual bread for today. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We've been over this. That there, there, this is central to God. Almost every single time that Jesus taught on prayer, it's connected to forgiveness. I believe with others that probably the number one reason why prayers are not heard and not answered is because there's unforgiveness in the heart of someone. We've already been over this last time with about worship in Matthew chapter 5 that God says, Jesus says, leave your gift at the altar. Be reconciled before you bring your... In other words, don't bring your worship if you've got something against somebody. And so we see here that Jesus talks and connects this also to prayer. We need to search our hearts, friend. Because daily, come on, daily the enemy would seek to put a root of bitterness in your heart. This is why the Hebrew writer in chapter 12 talks about the root of bitterness. And in the context, the writer says, look diligently... Look carefully to make sure no one comes short, falls short of the grace of God. And the context is, look that there's no root of bitterness. Because that root is what? That root is underground. That root can't be seen many times. We have to let God search our heart to make sure that there's no hidden offenses or resentment or any grudge. And that we're quick to forgive. Amen? Amen? Forgive, forgive, forgive. How do we forgive? Because we are first been receiving His forgiveness. We look to the cross and we remember the blood. We remember the sacrifice. We dare not hold on to unforgiveness. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Notice Jesus does not say, lead us not into sin. Lead us not into temptation. I believe this is connected to what Jesus says also in Matthew 26, 41, Luke twenty two forty six, 46, and Mark 14, 38. When Jesus exhorts his disciples, he says, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. Amen. Friend, I see so many, I want to encourage you tonight, there's so many Christians who are so, who are just trying to get, are trying to wonder how close or how far they'll be away from that edge of sin and falling off the precipice. God doesn't even want you near it. He doesn't want you to be wondering if you're going to be led into sin. He doesn't even want you to be led into temptation. But that thing that used to entice you doesn't entice you anymore. You're not attracted to that thing. That thing begins to repulse you and you have victory to walk in holiness. This is the will of God for us. This is not something that we kind of dance with and play with, but God wants us to know that through prayer, that's the context here when we say lead us unto temptation. It's prayer that God alerts us and awakens us to even see the temptation, let alone the sin. Hallelujah. Friend, you don't even have to come near it. Okay, can I I encourage you tonight? You don't even have to come near sin. Am I saying that we're all blameless? No. 
No, we, 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 there are times we fall, but we should be more, not a sinner who occasionally walks in holiness, but a saint who occasionally sins. It's a big difference. God has given us all of his precious promises, amen, that we can live a life of godliness. Praise the Lord for the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. And he says what? Deliver us from the evil one. You see the, you see the dependence that we must have on the Father? This is, this is the reality that there's real spiritual warfare. There's a real enemy friend who's way more clever than you or I. We need to ask God to deliver us from the evil one. I don't think that a lot of the church is even aware of the half of what the enemy does to keep us from walking with God. I'm telling you, friend, he is so clever, and he will mess even with your attitude. If you're wondering why sometimes, all of a sudden times, you feel irritated and irritable and short-tempered and, and impatient and, and, and someone just sets you off, you want to know a lot of that many times is spiritual. And if you're not asking God to deliver you, you'll be sucked into his snare. That you will become with a like attitude with the person who's trying to, or is even an instrument of the enemy to lead you to a place where you shouldn't be. And you'll, you'll, you'll mirror their attitude. You'll mirror their, their disposition. You'll mirror their spirit. And God has called us to affect them, not them us. So praise the Lord that God has given us this prayer. And we can pray this with boldness and confidence. God will deliver you. Ask Him to deliver you from evil. And then the Lord ends by this prayer, this praise. Much like the Psalms. You see David start with praise and he ends with praise. So we see that also here. Yours is the kingdom. It's a reminder as I'm praying, as I'm petitioning, as I'm worshiping. It's not about me. It's not about you. Yes, God welcomes us to give thanks and to petition. But ultimately what we are doing and what we are praying is with an attitude and a motivation for the glory of God, His kingdom, His power, His glory. Praise God. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It couldn't be any clearer, friend. You don't want to mess with unforgiveness. You don't want to. You've heard it many times. I think it's a great illustration. Unforgiveness is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It just is dumb. It doesn't do anything. It puts you in a prison that God wants you free from. I'm not going to spend uh, long on this last one. Let's finish up with this. Moreover, when you fast... Do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in, secret, in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Friend, I will encourage you again tonight. God expects us to fast. I, I want to say, don't, don't think like you're going to have to go on some long... Just take... Just fast a meal. Just start with that place of just setting a morning aside and saying, Lord, you are more important to me than my earthly food. I want you more than my own body wants food. I'm telling you, you just do that, friend, you begin to feel a fire rise in you. God, I want you more, more than even my own flesh is craving for. There's something about fasting, friend, that gets the attention of the Father. He delights in it. I love this quote by Hudson Taylor. He said, In Shansai, I found a Chinese, the Chinese Christians, they were accustomed to spend time in fasting and prayer. They recognized that this fasting, which so many dislike, which requires faith in God, since it makes one feel weak and poorly, is really a divinely appointed means of grace. Perhaps the greatest hindrance to our work is our own imagined strength. And in fasting, we learn what poor, weak creatures we are. Dependent on a meal of meat for the little strength which we are so apt to lean upon. Isn't that good? I'm telling you, friends, nothing like fasting to show how frail you are. And how much you need to depend on God. And He promises to those who recognize that. 
to those who are weak, who boast of their weakness, his power will be, will be made perfect in it. As I close, I was thinking about, Father, I want tonight your people to be encouraged to press in more. I want your people to be encouraged tonight. And I thought back and I said, Lord, what was it in my life? And I thought, and my Lord brought me, because friend, I grew up in the Christian, I grew up in the ch- Christian church. I came to service. I went to Wednesday night. I had, I had small encounters with God. But it wasn't until the end of my freshman year in college that I began to press into God all by myself in the face of a lot of sin. I said, God, I want more of you. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I began to taste and I began to hunger and there was a grace in me, there was a determination in me, I'm going to go into the secret place. And I want to encourage you tonight, friend. My life was forever changed when I just began to draw away with the Father. And at that time of my life, I was in a secular college, and I was playing rugby. And if any of you here know about college rugby, it's a bad culture. It's a culture of alcoholism most of the time, and a culture of hookup. And in the face of that culture, as I was seeking God, because this is what happens when we get close to God. As Leonard Ravenhill said, the man who is, or woman who is intimate with God is intimidated by no one. And when you begin to behold God, you begin to get a fear of God, you don't fear people anymore. And so as I'm playing rugby, I'm looking back. I was just praying this this afternoon, Lord, what is it, Lord? What's the memory you want me to have? And it was those memories of me coming away in, in, in an environment of debauchery and an environment of sin that as I pressed into God, God began to fill me with love. God began to fill me with boldness. And I began to go on the rugby field, and we would pray to our Father as a rugby team. These these guys don't know Jesus. We're all circled up. Our Father who art in heaven. And they would we all say together. And then after after we closed with our Father, then I began to pray out. I was new to rugby. They they let me, they they knew, they, they sensed something in me. And I began to cry out, Lord, give us strength. Hallelujah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, good. I mean, that, that's, that's, and I was like, Lord, give us the strength to run through a wall in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know if God is condoning that, okay? But all I'm saying, that was a fire in my heart. And as these guys are around who are walking in worldly ways and living in sin, they're hearing passion for God. And it got to a place, friend, that they wouldn't start the rugby game until Wade bled out in prayer. And you know what? I didn't see fruit right away. But I came back later and I had some of the the ones who were the the chief of the sinners who were coming up to me and saying, Wade, I want to follow God. I remember. I remember how you led. I remember the example you gave. And I want to follow God. God is convicting me. I don't want to live this way anymore. Come on, friend. When we are in with God, when we are calling on God in the secret place, you will impact your environment, even a rugby team. There's nothing difficult for God. And we as a church must be on the offense in our, in our attitude, not on the defense. Like, I hope it doesn't stick to me. I hope it doesn't go. No, friend, greater is he that's in you than the one that's in this world. That authority, that boldness, that courage, that love comes when you're alone with the Father. And I want to encourage you here tonight. God wants to use you in a mighty way. Would you draw near to Him? Would you say tonight, God, I'm sorry, Lord, for, for letting distraction and discouragement keep me from pressing into you. God, would you give me grace tonight to pull away more with you? And Lord, I want to be used to bring your kingdom. I want your will to be done through my life. I want, Lord God, people to see that you are real and you live in me. 
Would you pray that right now? Would you just bow your head with me right now? Well, let's talk to him and let's ask God that we would have a deeper awareness of his nearness and his waiting for us to meet with him. Friend, he's not waiting for us. We're not waiting for him. He's waiting for us. He's wanting us to draw near. He says, draw near. I'm, I will draw near to you. I am a rewarder, he says, to those who diligently seek me. Let's recognize tonight, like the disciples, that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Let's recognize tonight that God wants us to learn how to pray. And he's given us a model. He's not left us ignorant. But he's given us an understanding of how we're to pray. And a prayer of the Father will answer.